Hi, I am Phil and this is a video. If you're a fan of the fantasy genre, you probably already know the name Brandon Sanderson. But if you don't, he is the author of probably half of the fantasy novels in any given bookstore. Assuming there are still bookstores. He's also a one-man publishing machine and an author who stared down Amazon to make a better deal for all authors on Audible. He's also a Mormon whose books are just like chock full of religion. So I've got some thoughts. Hi, I'm Phil and this is a video about fantasy novels and real world religions. The first Brandon Sanderson novel I ever read was Mistborn The Final Empire. I had found it in my local library. It was a fantasy novel, which already had me interested, but more than that, it billed itself as a heist story or a crime novel. I'd heard it described as both. And I was so excited because crime novels are my favorite genre in the world. Unfortunately for me, uh, Mistborn is not really a heist story. That's not to say there aren't heists or cons in it, there certainly are, but there's none of the texture of real-world criminality that really makes a heist story stand out for me. I feel like this is mostly because the world of the Final Empire is a very, very alien one. Something I've learned is that the worlds in Brandon Sanderson's novels are the real main characters of his story. Uh, new elements are consistently introduced, new planets with new magic systems, new metaphysical concepts in each series. The characters, on the other hand, serve more as trope signifiers rather than real people. Like Ven is the streetwise urchin with a gift, Kelsier is the charismatic rebel with a secret past. The rest of the cast are just kind of like the broad strokes that you see in characters as like side characters in a JRPG. But I really like JRPGs sometimes, so I'm still a fan of the series. Once I'd pulled myself away from the disappointment that the books weren't the series I'd imagined them to be, I could finally see the elements of the story that really stood out as being interesting. The world building. Now, when it comes to lore, I'm strictly in the camp of what YouTuber Dale Kingsmill calls vague and evocative. Uh, but the sort of work that Sanderson was doing in representing religion and the way it develops, it was unique, uh, even more so considering that Sanderson is a member of the LDS Church. It wasn't until I got to his flagship Stormlight Archive series that I began to see what I kind of consider the forest for the trees of his writing. In the Stormlight Archive, I started to see these cartoon characters as a feature rather than a bug. Because when I stopped imagining Sanderson's characters as real people and began picturing them as something from Avatar The Last Airbender, I started to notice more ideas that had always been present. The worlds that Sanderson crafts are as beautiful and nuanced in their physics as they are in their metaphysics, and the characters that interact with those worlds do not just do so in a material way, but in a much more abstract way they interact with the fabric of their reality. Ideas about the nature of God and reality and an individual's ability to alter it are all taken in a very serious way with a lot of interesting questions. The best comparison I can make to this is with George Lucas's early work on Star Wars. Lucas was coming out of film school and developing his ideas in the fertile soil of New Hollywood, and he was interested in developing a popular mythology. He was inspired by the work of Joseph Campbell and even more problematic figures in mythic history like George Fraser, the author of The Golden Bough. Lucas bridged his love of the pulpy adventure fantasy comics of his youth with these fresh interpretations of philosophy and narrative history. But artists aren't always philosophers, and the philosophical ideas of Star Wars were maybe boundary pushing in the 60s and 70s with concepts like dualism and a unified field of all living things. But these high concept ideas were left by the wayside when it came to the real success of Star Wars, which is merchandising. Any complicated ideas were quickly shunted far enough into the background to not get in the way of the action figures. George Lucas is a billionaire, and Brandon Sanderson writes fantasy novels. So how does Sanderson's Cosmere series compare to the original Star Wars trilogy? Well, first of all, they're both aimed at the widest possible audience. 
Star Wars is made in such a way as to make total sense to 13-year-olds. Ideas of genocide, familial trauma, and transhumanism all are brought up in Star Wars, but the framing is sanitized and simplified for mass market consumption. In a similar way, Sanderson's Cosmere writing is clear. I've heard of the approach being called Windex prose because it's so straightforward. Rarely does Sanderson's vocabulary or prose ever leave a lot of room for ambiguity, and that seems to be a deliberate choice. Like Star Wars before it, Sanderson's Cosmere smuggles in real-world questions about faith and ideology. Let me give you a couple of examples that I think I've spotted in Mistborn and in the Stormlight Archive. Uh, there are going to be some pretty major spoilers uh, for at least both of them, and uh, they're going to follow. If you've read the first Mistborn trilogy, you know that Kelsier, our charismatic leader, dies in a pretty gruesome and public way. After his death, it's revealed that Kelsier had spent the last few years of his life building himself up as a cultic figure, down to recruiting an accomplice to impersonate his resurrection and commission his followers to keep the faith. Right? This is the Christ trope. This is a very clear subversion of the story of Jesus Christ. It's not a unique interpretation. There's shades of uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, and there's certainly a lot of biblical research of what we call the historical Jesus present in the way that Sanderson presents Kelsier. What's interesting is that, by all accounts, a very devout Mormon presented these complicated ideas of the historical Jesus in a young adult fantasy series. I thought it was pretty cool, but I didn't think too much of it, and I kept reading the books. Eventually, I ran across a guy on TikTok named Dr. Dan McClellan. Dr. Dan McClellan is a scholar in the study of the Bible and religion. He combats misinformation about Christianity and the Christian religion, and he breaks down issues of textual criticism in a way that normal people can understand and isn't afraid to contradict religious dogma. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, here's a video of his. Fair warning, this is going to be like three minutes of discussions of Bronze Age religious history in the Levant. I think one of the coolest passages in all the Bible is the one that talks about God's Father. Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. I'm a scholar of the Bible and religion. And the fit for this video is Bizarro Superman. And if you look up Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 in the King James Version, it will say that the Most High divided up the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. But scholars now know, based on the ancient Greek translation of this passage, as well as on a fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that it originally said that Elyon, the Most High, divided up the nations according to the number of the B'nai Elohim, the children of God. And then verse 9 says, and Adonai's portion was his people. Jacob was his share of the inheritance. And so this text describes Elyon, the Most High, giving Adonai, the nation of Israel, as their inheritance. This likely distinguishes Elyon, the Most High, from Adonai and identifies Adonai as one of the B'nai Elohim, one of the children of God. And this would fit with the broader Northwest Semitic pantheon that put the storm deity on the second tier of the pantheon among the B'nai Elohim. And Adonai is repeatedly in the Hebrew Bible represented as a storm deity. In fact, there are passages where Adonai is taking over poetry originally dedicated to Baal. For instance, in Psalm 29, we have this sevenfold praise of the voice of Adonai. But all the places it mentions, like Lebanon and Syrian and Kadesh, are places further north, the territory of the Northwest Semitic storm deity Baal, not of Adonai. And so this was likely poetry originally praising Baal that was then appropriated by Israelite scholars wanting to praise Adonai based on the same terms. Similarly, Isaiah 27.1 talks about in that day Adonai will punish Leviathan, the wriggling serpent, the twisting serpent, the dragon that lives in the sea. And portions of this are word for word quoting a much earlier Ugaritic text that praises Baal as the one who defeated Litan, the wriggling serpent, the twisting serpent, the dragon with seven heads. And so once again, 
a story involving the northwest Semitic storm Didi Bal is appropriated by Adonai, the God of Israel. So Adonai was likely a secondary addition to the pantheon. The original patron deity of Israel would be El, the northwest Semitic high deity. And Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 likely originally maintained the distinction of the two. And it's worked into a very old piece of poetry in Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. But it seems to be even older than that poetry because it is introduced in verses 6 and 7 by saying, ask your fathers and they will tell you, your elders and they will say, and then we have verses 8 and 9. So this is likely even older traditions that distinguished Adonai from El Yon, who is presented in Deuteronomy 32.8 as the father of the God of Israel. All right, I can hear you now. What does this have to do with Brando Sando, Phil? Okay, impatient but eager viewer, you've read Stormlight Archive, right? You know, on the planet of Roshar, in the region of Kolinar, they are known to worship a paternal god known as the Almighty. In the course of our early books, we discover that the Almighty is shown to be dead. He's been replaced by a second tier deity known as the Storm Father. I think the similarities are obvious. Now, am I saying that Brandon Sanderson knows who Dr. Dan McClellan is? No, of course not. I mean, they're both queer affirming Mormons working out of Utah, but it's a big state. Am I saying that Brandon Sanderson is using his almost young adult epic fantasy series to smuggle in real world uses of historicity and religious development? Uh, yeah, I, I think I am. Anyway, uh, I'm Phil and this was a video.